Hey, uh, I, yes, thank you for that prayer. I'm bringing the word, but you're listening. You're taking it in. You're going to humbly come before God and his word today. If you want to turn to Matthew, that's where we're going to be. If you've been here much at all, uh, you can turn there. But hey, uh, so how are you doing today? I want you to really like think about that. We've been doing a lot of kind of um, inward, you know, heart stuff and thinking about how you're doing in your life. Um, we got a lot going on here at the church. We've got a lot going on in our lives. In fact, as a family, um, in fact, I want to check in on, on little Henry, um, see how he's doing. He's still cute. All right. He's doing well. He's still cute. Um, this is our grandson. We have a brand new uh, first, first grandson. Uh, Whitney gave birth to uh, Henry Matthew McIntosh La- yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you. But um, just rejoice, yes, with our family. We love y'all so much. And, and uh, it's just reminding me again of, you know, we're talking about rest and how, whoo, if you've got a newborn, uh, how many parents we got here? You might remember, I was talking to some other parents earlier this morning, and if you've walked through this before, it's like, that was a blur. Like, like yeah, let's, okay, you got to take pictures, because you're like, I don't remember that, you know? Um, and that's kind of where we are with, uh, with Stacy. <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm doing anything. But stacy has been really helping uh, Whitney, and I've just vicariously, I've been like, I'm tired. Like, y'all are not sleeping. They're up all night. And then, he, like, he, you know, it's just constant. Um, and I was just reminded, we had twins. And so I say it this way, like if you have one, you don't sleep much at all. Um, you might get handle it with two parents there. But if you have twins, you don't sleep at all. Like it doesn't, you tag team sleeping is what we called it, uh, where one would sleep and then your turn, I'm going to be awake now. And it's just nonstop. But I wonder, what is it that's in your life that keeps, you know, just gaining all of your attention in your mind that keeps you up at night? What is it that just keeps you thinking and maybe you can't sleep or throughout the day you're thinking about it? A lot of us have this low-grade kind of weariness. I've talked to a lot of people, asked our staff this week and others. You know, the beauty of being a pastor, I'm with people at all stages of life. I don't know if you're that way in your life, but it's, it's a unique thing, I think. And meeting people in really challenging seasons, whether it was a funeral earlier this week, you know, or a wedding or a challenge, or I, just, I talked to a, a couple last night who um, some of y'all may have heard, we have brand new members in our church um, whose house in Lake Highlands, their house burned down. Uh, They have a two-year-old and one coming, uh, the Ashtons, brand new members, came to Discover a couple weeks ago. And um, by the way, if you want to, you know, just know more about that and or how can we help, they they need our help and we want to be the church around them. So I say that because there's a lot that we struggle with and a lot that we wrestle with. But one of the things that I've seen in our lives and just kind of this low grade, I asked the staff this, how many of y'all are tired? You know, and there's one thing to be tired. It's another thing to be weary. One uh, therapist said that depression is when you're just tired of dealing with it, whatever it is. And you may have something that you feel like, wow, it's just ongoing. Like maybe you feel like it'll never end. Or maybe it's a challenge in your own heart and your mind filled with anxiety because of something you can't quite release. You can't find, here's the word, you can't find rest. And it's just kind of nonstop. Today, we're going to encourage you. And we're going to turn to the one who has all the answers, Jesus. We're all about Jesus here. He's Lord. And we're going to discover that he has an answer for us. You know, because what's happening, too, in our culture, I think this coming out of COVID, I was reading a lot uh, this week about long COVID. You heard about this? So some of us are impacted by that, where there's this chronic fatigue syndrome, even literally, or mental challenges that come. We're not real sure what the effects will be, but, but we're learning more. And then add to that, we got inflation and gas prices and all this stuff. Some of, some of you feel like you're working harder than ever, but you're not gaining the traction you know, just to maintain where you want to be. So there's a lot on us right now. So if you feel that way, I'm not trying to project anything on you, but I'm trying to help you see that you're not alone, okay? So what I want you to do is turn to Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to read a passage of Scripture. Then we're going to unpack it, and we're going to close our service, kind of bookends in, in a way that, that Han led us, as you hear the Word of God and then apply, as you've already thought about what you're wrestling with in these days. Jesus is going to teach us that rest, we're going to talk about Sabbath rest, um, which is not just the day of the week, you'll discover. It's bigger than that. Sabbath rest, soulful, gospel, peace, and rest comes when, when, we, when we enter into rest. I'm going to talk about at the end how we do this literally, give you some guidance there. But rest actually 
um, embrace his authority in our lives. You'll see what this means here in a moment. Um, rest actually um, elevates work, ironically, uh, in a way that we'll see Jesus teaches us. And then rest finally brings, really encourages the weary. So that's what we want to do. I hope, we want you to be encouraged today for being here. So um, let's, let's jump in. I'm going to le- read this passage and then we'll come back to it and unpack it because I think it makes more sense. Um, not just uh, walking along, but really reading the whole passage. It's, an, it's eight verses. So look at this in Matthew 12. If you have your Bible, um, join us there. Matthew 12. Uh, at that time, Jesus went through the grains on the Sabbath. Now, he's already given the Sermon on the Mount. You know, we talked about how he's king, and this is what the kingdom looks like. He's been uh, uh, healing people along the way, teaching what the kingdom's like. Healing as if to say, this doesn't happen in my kingdom, and that doesn't happen in my kingdom, and this will not. It's a kingdom of restoration and renewal. And he's, and he's asked us, of course, to join in this. And his disciples, it says, were hungry. And they began pluck, uh, plucking... Yeah, they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only the priests, only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All right, now, there's several uh, things in this story that maybe are hard to grasp at first reading. So we're going to go back and unpack it and then apply. Always applying God's word. Uh, and first, I want you to see that rest embraces authority. This story is all about um, the, really the Sabbath. Okay, you, you catch that. And you might know enough about the Sabbath that it was a law, right? It was one of the Ten Commandments. You're to, you're to keep, make the Sabbath holy. Keep it separate. Keep it holy. And, and it's a lot about that. But really what this passage is about is Jesus' authority. Like, does he have any authority to say this kind of thing? And what we're going to see today is that when we rest, it, it's, it's allowing him to, to have total authority over our lives. Rest is a statement, an act of faith is what it is. So look at what it says here. At that time, Jesus went in the grain fields in Sabbath, and they were hungry. Okay, so they began to pluck uh, grains, uh, little grains of wheat. Now, here's the thing. This was not unlawful. Um, the Torah said that you can't, there's certain, you know, work, you can't work on the Sabbath and you can't harvest. So it was just specific to harvesting. What happened after the Torah was given, uh, the Mishnah, it's called, uh, it's kind of commentary and all the, the specifics about how to keep all the commands. And so they just added, heaped on all of these commands in the Mishnah, later in the Talmud, you probably heard of that, like a commentary on the Torah. And what they had done, ironically, the Pharisees had made the Sabbath, which was a day of rest, they made it really hard to rest with all the rules. And so what they're doing, they're, imagine, that we, you, know, you don't see this a lot unless you like pick a piece of grass and put it in your mouth or something, you know, you've been out, outside the city somewhere. Um, or like me, I love the honeysuckle. You know what I'm talking about? Take a honeysuckle. And... Okay. Anyway, that's another thing. That's about what they're doing. I mean, this is more like, like, like even poor people could come and take uh, some grain. You couldn't like pull, transplant, and plant it somewhere else. That would constitute stealing. But you, this was not a thing that was, you know, unlawful. So they're just walking along. This is more like, say, being at Costco or somewhere and go, hey, they got sample of food over here. Let's go. And it's like, yes, take some, please. It's more like that. They're, they're, and then they're saying that it's, that it's not lawful. What they are doing in their understanding of the Sabbath, they're always looking for somebody. It's odd that the Pharisees are here and saw this even. They're watching him. They're tracking him now at this point. And they're looking for anything. And what they're claiming is, this is what you know, commentators note, and even it, we see this, these specifications in the Mishnah. What they're claiming is, you guys are actually reaping and harvesting. You're like, what? They're reaping, okay, pulling off 
right, reaping, and then they're, then they're having to separate the, the, the chaff, right, from the wheat, and then they're eating. They're harvesting. You guys are working, you know, is what they're doing here. So they're coming after Jesus and his disciples, and then it, it says this in verse 2, but the Pharisees saw it, and they said to him, yeah, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful. And, and so then, look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. He said to them, have you not read? Now, this has a little sting to it. You're talking to Pharisees, okay, who know the Bible better than we do, who know the Old Testament, like backwards and forwards, memorized uh, large portions of the, of the Torah. Some have said, in some cases, the entire uh, Torah. Have you not read? Like, do you guys read your Bible at all? Did, and it's, this seems like a strange defense or analogy. When David was hungry, and those were with him, so he went into the house of God and ate the showbread, it's called. It was bread that, that was used in worship. And, and literally a loaf of bread, 12 pieces of bread, six piles, uh, I mean, six loaves, six pieces, uh, making two piles. And it represented God's covenant with his people. So every week they would come in with a showbread, the priest only, and they would, they would put it there on the table in the, in the Holy of Holies, in the temple. And it would, it would be a, an offering to God represented the priest representing the people. And so it was used for worship. It was sanctified. It was holy. David comes with his men, and he's actually given the bread to eat. So he eats it. Only the priest was to eat it after the fact. And David and his men eat. So what's going on here? Jesus is kind of lifting. He's saying, you, you saw back in the Old Testament they lit, that the ceremonial laws that you're, you're challenging that were, uh, are, were lifted. Now, never were the moral laws lifted, by the way. These are two different things. And this is the point Jesus is making here. Like, thou shalt not murder. Don't commit adultery. Stealing. Okay, all the things. Um, none of those were ever lifted, nor will they ever be. And, and yet, the ceremonial laws were lifted. So what does this mean? Logically, what would that mean? It means they were provisional. They were temporary. And this is what Jesus is saying. It means that they were temporary until something better would come along. Jesus now stands before them, the bread of life, the high priest who represents us, you know, bridges the gap between us and God. He's standing there talking to them. And he's saying, so here's what's happened. Look, the ceremonial laws are going to shift. They, they may change. He's saying, like how, and this is what makes him, makes him crazy. How, do you, how are you saying how the law goes down? How is it that you, who do you think you are? And he says, I have all authority, is what he's saying. I mean, he, land, he lands it where this is heading, right? I'll tell you who I am. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. That's who I am. I mean, he's saying, I can decide what the Sabbath is. I'm God. I'm, in fact, I am the one to whom all of this points. You see, in fact, the discipline of rest rescues us from bondage. Now play this out. Think how this goes. Sabbath rest. We go back into the Old Testament. All right. What happens is God rescues his people out of bondage. This is the first salvific story of the Old Testament. First salvation story. You have the Exodus, right? So he says, you're my people and Moses, I'm going to use you. I'm going to call you out. Moses becomes a type. The writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is greater than Moses. Because he comes to rescue us from our sin. He goes in and he says, you're going to be my people. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rescue you out of slavery. Okay? Slaves don't rest. Slaves work. I'm going to pull you out. And I'm going to bring you to, to out in to be my people. And he says then, let's have a covenant together. He enters into this covenant. There's marriage uh, language all around it. He's marrying the people. And he says, here's our commitment. Here's yours to mine. I mean, to me and mine to yours. I'm committed to you. He gives them the Ten Commandments. The fourth one says, you shall keep the Sabbath holy, separate, okay, as a people. And, and he says this. It's, it's, one, it's the one that has commentary to it. I mean, a couple of the, the commands do, but this is one that does. And, he, and it says this. It says that you will keep the Sabbath and make it holy. You will rest on the Sabbath just as God did when he rested after he completed uh, creation. Okay, so I'm spending some time here because this is important to understand. You might know that after every day that God created something and he completed the day and completed that thing, what did he say? He proclaimed that it is what? Good. It's good. 
Do you know what he said when he finished all of creation on the seventh day? He said, it's very good. This is all very good. Here's the point. He finished the work. You could even, de- you could even define work as having, I mean, rest, really, defined as work com- completed. Work that is satisfactory, uh, f- satisfactorily finished. Very good is a statement that God is saying, all is finished, creation has been accomplished, and it is very good, it's all good. And there's this satisfaction that comes then with rest. That's why, here it is, this is our problem, right? This is why we can't rest. We're not satisfied with the work, or we finish a work. It's not like God's not still at work. And how about this? God doesn't need rest. He doesn't have rest. He's doing this for us to say this covenant, you will find rest in me. The writer of Hebrews does this in in Hebrews 4. He says there's coming a rest for God's people because they never found it. He he references the Israelites. They never did find rest through the, the keeping of the command of Sabbath because there's a deeper rest. There's work under the work that's gotta be done before you really experience rest. And the reason you and I can't rest is because we haven't fully embraced the finished work that God has already accomplished for us. We can't cease from our work. Why? Because we define ourselves by what we do. See, the challenge uh, for us this morning, rest is a proclamation of faith because what we're doing is we're saying, I am not what I do. I am not what I produce. I am more than what I produce. And then secondly, the Sabbath rest or Sabbath keeping is the world won't stop if I do. You're not God. You come under the authority of God under Jesus and you're able to rest. Rest is so hard for many of us because we think the world spins around us. And here's the key today. So I'm spending a lot of time here. Jesus has completed the work necessary for you to rest. He has finished the work. The work under the work has already been done. And you've got to embrace what Christ has accomplished for you. Our sin has separated us from God. And so, friends, some of you need to hear this. You've never received Christ. And this is a challenge for you. Some of you watching online, perhaps. This is the challenge. You will never rest if you don't understand that the work that needs to be done, why your mind cannot stop, why your heart is always uncertain, it's, there's always unrest, dis-ease, enmity is what the Bible calls it. Between you and God, you're always seeking to perform. Think about it. To, we all wrestle with this even. We slip back into it, even those of us who believe and understand what Christ has done for us. We, we, like, I've, I've got to keep working because that's how I define myself by what I produce. And if I can produce more, then I have more worth. The problem is the work is never finished. But something else is driving that. It is a need to find your worth, your identity in what you do, the approval of others, uh, your performance, all your people who like you, all the fans, all the stuff, the applause, and you can't stop working. But what you need to know today, friends, is that Jesus Christ finished the work on the cross. And when he was on the cross and said, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What is it? The work necessary for us to have peace with God and peace finally in our hearts and then live out of that. That is gospel rest. That is peace. He proclaims you, watch this, when you receive Christ by faith, not by works, by faith in what he has done for you, dying on the cross for your sin so that you can have peace with God. When you receive that, he says of you, you are very good, totally satisfactory before me. You are fully forgiven. You're totally loved, completely received. I am satisfied with you just as you are. Friend, you can rest. Rest acknowledges his authority. He is Lord over your life. If you can't rest, it's because you're still seeking to be Lord over your own life. 
So spend a lot of time there. The next thing I want you to see, ironically, is that rest actually elevates work. And I'm not talking about, this is not Sabbath rest, like living for the weekend. And like, I'm going to crash. And then today, if I can just rest, I'll be ready for tomorrow. That's not Sabbath rest. Because tomorrow you're going to get tired again, and then you live for the weekend. That's not what we're talking about here. So when I say elevate work, elevates work, hey, look at what Jesus says in chapter 5, I mean, verse, verse 5. Or have you not read in the law on the, on the Sabbath, the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath but are guiltless? He's saying the priests are working on the Sabbath, but they weren't guilty. I mean, it's not unlike my, you know, a lot of you are serving on Sunday and working hard. Praise be to God, worshiping him through our work. But, you know, like today's kind of like a work day for me, you know, right? I mean, like our staff, we get here really early, we're here six, eight hours or so, meetings later perhaps. And it's a, it's a work day. So I, along with some of you, I've got to choose another day that's going to be Sabbath for me. Not to be legalistic, but I do believe that that stands. You should have a day. You'd have 24 hours where you're off the clock, where you're away from your phone as best you can be, where you're, how about this, you break the pattern. But here's what I want you to see here. What Jesus is saying is that, look, I am king. And what the disciples are doing here with me as my disciples following in the kingdom here, learning how to live now uh, kingly, kingly lives under the reign and authority of the king. They're doing priestly work is what they're doing. See, now we become, right, the priesthood of the believers means that when we come under Christ and his reign and rule of our lives, we become God's representatives in the world. That's what the priest was for the people. Now we stand in the gap for all, all the people in our lives as a representative and ambassador of Christ wherever we go. Your work now matters because your vocation, that's a good biblical word, your calling is to that place where you are. Now you work out of rest in Christ and you're able to show the world what it looks like to be Jesus in your role. Student in that classroom, in that grade, on that team, at that work, whatever you do, you are now Christ's representative doing priestly work. And the disciples are now discovering that they can follow Jesus and they are not stuck by all the directions and all the laws and keeping up and doing all the stuff to appease God and to gain his approval. Because now, here's the word, there's freedom. There's freedom in Christ, and I can live in a very different way. And Jesus says our work now has been elevated. Look at what he says in verse 6. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. What? I mean, to understand that this is a mic drop is what this is. The one for whom the temple was built is here, standing right in front of you. The one to whom the temple pointed. How about this? The temple was where the location of the presence of God was in the Holy of Holies, right? Now the location of the presence of God is in the person of Jesus. But watch this. Now he sends his spirit to us, living in us when we receive him, enter into this Trinitarian dance of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now he invites us in. We commune with him. The entire Christian life is about abiding in him. Wherever I go, wherever you go, if you are in Christ, you've received his grace, you are going there as God's representative. And now your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is, is doing here. He's saying their work is, is priestly work. It's kingdom work. And I am the king. And now all of my followers are doing priestly work in the world as they've now joined me to bring this kingdom wherever we find ourselves and something greater, someone greater than the temple is here. I mean, this is amazing. Rest embraces his authority. And if you can't do it, you're not embracing his lordship. If you can't stop, that's a sign. And, 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 and if you, if, if you can't, can't rest, you're never going to see that you can live out of this Sabbath rest and live in this rest. And people see you at work and or wonder why you're such a non-anxious presence because I'm, I'm at rest. I know who I am. I'm not trying to please everybody around me. I'm not, I don't work just for a paycheck. That's not why I'm here. It's nice, but I'm here to be his representative in this place. And people see that you work differently with excellence in all that you do, giving glory to him. 
So rest elevates our work. And finally, we'll close with this. Rest encourages the weary. This is where I want to encourage you if you haven't been challenging you here. Jesus' final argument is that keeping the Sabbath like the Pharisees is completely out of whack. Now, this is, you know, know, lots of grace, I guess, even towards the Pharisees because all they knew was law. And I, I go places around the world where people have never heard the gospel of grace. That's all we would know. How do you get to God? What have I got to do? I got to do something. How do I get? How can I appease him? That's all they've ever known. And Jesus is saying, it's not about following the directions. It's not about gaining God's approval. Instead, if you really understood this thing, look at verse 7. If you really knew what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Now, we've already noted that he said this in Matthew 9, 13. This is out of Hosea 6, 6. This must be a really big deal. He's saying it's not about what you give up. It's not about following all the rules, the sacrifices, and all the stuff. There, there is that. There's this giving of your life away to him constantly. Dying to yourself is what he would say. Um, there's that constantly. But it's more about what God gives to us. Mercy and grace. And then extending that to others in our lives. He says, you, you've, you've got to, you have the whole entire relationship wrong. He says, if you only knew what this meant. And then he, then he drops the bomb on him in verse 8. For the Son of Man, referring to himself, is Lord of the Sabbath. Now he's going to go on and he's going to heal a man with a withered hand. Right after this. Then they completely freak. But what he's doing is, he's going, watch this. Mercy. Grace, healing, restoration. Your rules are keeping you from it all. And he heals the man. And then it says in verse 14, if you have your Bible in front of you there, look it down at verse 14. They plotted to kill him. What? Because he's healing a withered hand? See how jacked up this is? It's messed up when we add all that we want to add to what we can do and bring and then force others to live that way and be legalistic instead of extending grace. But they knew what he was saying. This is why they're plotting to kill him. He's saying, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I invented the Sabbath. The Sabbath is all about me. You find rest in me in the end. This is where this is heading. Because right before this, I didn't tell you this, but in, look at chapter 11, verse 28. Right before this story, he says this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then this happens. I mean, this, but look at this. He says, come to me. This is how I want to land this. I want to give you some practical guidance. But he's saying, come to me. He's not saying, come to the weekend. Like, make it to the weekend. Live for the weekend. He's not saying that. He's not even saying, go to your favorite, um, you know, beach house or find, you wait for vacation, come to vacation, come to your favorite mountain house. I mean, all those are good things. I'm getting kind of excited just thinking about something like that. But, um, but, but he's saying, no, come to me. See, there's a difference between leisure, like chilling and binging on Netflix going, yeah, that's how I rest. I just like to rest like that. Mm, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm all about watching something great on Netflix, but is it edifying? See, Sabbath rest is focusing in and praising. Not that you're just there reading your Bible or praying the whole time or something. Though there's that. But it's really focusing in on, man, God, you, it's getting out of your pattern of work. That's what it is. It's saying, I'm going to not do this. It's like music. It's a rhythm like music. See, music is music and not noise because of the space between the notes. It's a rhythm. Otherwise, it's just noise. It's like doing an art, it's like a piece of artwork. If I'm, if I'm painting something or drawing, uh, if you're an artist, you, you're, you be, you're at it, you're working on it, you're focused, but then you, you decide to step back because you have to, you really need to. Or if you stay there, you'll back up and go, yee, that is off. Like that perspective or that, yikes, let me get back in here. And you come back to it. Sabbath rest is a rhythm of stepping away and coming back, but you've got to step away. Sabbath rest is to, uh, it's an intentional absence in order that you might really come back into it or do your life under the authority and presence of God, to be fully present. And it means you've you've got to step away. So there are some things that you can do. And and, and really what I want to talk about here, um, we're going to lean towards uh, a time of prayer. Okay, as we close, like I said. 
but here's what I want you to hear before we get into some, some real practical ways that you can, how you can apply this. When Jesus was on the cross, as I noted, he said, it is finished. And friends, all of this starts with, with this idea that Sabbath keeping is more than, than, than just stepping away even one day a week. It's actually living in him. The entire Christian life is abiding in him. Living out of rest. And so what I would do, I, I would challenge you with this. It's, it's to have a pattern in your life every day that allows you to step away from it all. Andy Crouch has a great book. In fact, it's on our, we put it out on our social media. Um, it's out this morning. It'll be on our sermon response guide. He has 10 commitments of a tech wise family. And he talks about how to break away from your screens because that is the thing that keeps us going. It keeps our minds spinning. You've heard much about this. A lot of research has done to the damage that it's doing to us if we don't step away. He has like, for instance, an hour a day off the screens and all of our students gasped. Um, a day out of the week, total day off the screens and a week out of the year. If you can do that more, again, if I gave you five ways to practice this, I'm just practice the Sabbath and I'm doing what the Pharisees are trying to do. You've got to seek out what is best for you. For some of you, it might mean putting an away message on your email. Like, I just, I can't. I'm, I just need space. It might mean telling your team, this is when I'm off, you know, if you're able to do that. Like, I'm really away. And try to model that for other people. Um, this is really hard. You might imagine, as a pastor, I'm kind of always on. I called, a, I called this family last night who had lost everything in a fire. Um, and, and talk with them, you know, later, later in the night. There's just always needs, right? So I have to practice this, you know, some days got to be a day where I, I got to get away from it all. Or I just start to be depleted and then uh, tired and weary, right? The Lord's never called us to live that way. I heard um, it was Rick Warren who years ago, and I've tried to live this out. He, he says, like only Rick can say, he, he said, divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. And the diverting daily means that you've got to be in his word. Are you, do you, are you in his word daily? Every day? And if not, I, this is, I love you. But I really wonder, do you want to hear from him? I've said it, you know, many times. How do you hear from God? How can I hear this kind of message all the time in my life? I need this. I need this Monday morning. I need this Wednesday night. Uh, there's a book for that. It's how you do that. So, friends, are you in his word? Is he really Lord of your life? And so what I want us to do, I want us to just close our time in prayer, okay? And um, we're just going to end the whole service in prayer right now. And, uh, and I'm just going to guide you, okay? So I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want us to uh, just re reflect again on the question that Han asked us earlier. What is it for you? What is it that, that is, is keeping you in this, this season or spirit of unrest in your heart, in your life? What is it? You need to give it to him now. Just release it to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's what confession is. Confession leads to repentance, which is actually an action. Starts in the heart, but what are you going to do? And how about this? Who are you going to tell? Like someone to be accountable with you. Somebody that can help you rest. How will you apply uh, this message? Sabbath keeping is proclaiming not only that I am not what I produce. I am defined by Jesus Christ. I'm forgiven. I'm totally perfect. I'm very good before him because his righteousness now covers me. I live in that and I live out of that. But Sabbath keeping is also that we are committed to avoid the idol of productivity. G 
Jesus reigns above it all. He's over our lives. So, Lord, we give you our lives. And, friend, if you're here today and you've never done so, you never have received his grace, he died on the cross for your sin. But you must receive it. He says, come to me. And that invitation is open right now. And it's open tomorrow. And it's open on Friday morning. And it's open every day of your life. He says, come to me. But right now, he's telling some of you, hearing my voice, to come to him right now. Say yes to him. Receive his grace. Stop running. He's accomplished all the work necessary for you to have a right relationship before God. So say, Jesus, come in my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life in response as an act of worship. I give you my life. Lord, may we be bold enough to practice to put into practice, to apply this message to our life this week. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.